Welcome to the most affordable path to organic gardening excellence, brought to you by Queen of the Sungrown. Today, we spotlight an age-old secret embraced by gardeners worldwide, now made more accessible than ever, yucca root extract powder. Envision your garden not just surviving, but flourishing, even under the harshest sun. Thanks to yucca root extract, this dream is within reach. Derived from the resilient yucca plant native to the arid regions of southwestern North America, our yucca root extract powder becomes an indispensable ally for your garden. Why yucca? Its myriad of benefits speaks volumes. It's your garden's shield against heat stress, ensuring plants remain vibrant and productive. It's a natural enhancer for nutrient uptake, making every drop of water and nutrient count. It transforms your soil, encouraging healthy growth and aeration. And it acts as a gentle yet effective pest deterrent, safeguarding your garden naturally. The secret isn't just in the plant, but in making it available to all. The saponins and yucca act as natural surfactants, facilitating critical water and nutrient absorption, while its biopesticidal properties offer a sustainable solution to keeping pests at bay. With Queen of the Sun Grown, yucca's full potential is unlocked, bringing unparalleled resilience and vigor to your garden. Transform your gardening practice with the most affordable yucca root extract powder on the market. Exclusively for our listeners, use code SUNGROWN for 20% off your first order. Experience the transformative power of yucca today. Your garden will show its gratitude. Visit us at queenofthesungrown.com to discover more and claim your special offer. Queen of the Sungrown, harness the affordable power of yucca root and watch your garden thrive. Welcome back to Sun Grown Stories, Tales from a Holistic Garden. I'm your host, Alexandria Irons, and today is Season 1, Episode 2, Women of Weed. In honor of Women's Day, we are going to explore why female cannabis plants are so important to cannabis cultivators. Hint, hint, it has to do with seedless flower. Then we will give some appreciation to a few of the many talented women I know in this industry who are leading the way in their respective fields, from commercial cultivation, to studying and advocating the medicinal compounds of the plant, to those building brands and supporting other women, as well as political activism and reducing the stigma. These women have been in the trenches working to advocate for this plant and our right to access it. So, without further ado, let's get into it. All right, so in the plant world, there are species that contain both female and male parts. And those plants are known as monoecious, literally translating to one house. For example, squash and corn contain both male and female sex organs on a single plant. But cannabis, like other dioecious species, produce separate male and female plants, which is a good thing for us. Otherwise, we would always have seeded flower. For those of you listening that don't know this, we don't want seeds in the bud that we smoke. Therefore, we have to keep male plants out of our gardens to keep them from impregnating the females. When growing vast acres of cannabis from seed, this can definitely be a problem. Think hemp fields um, for industrial purposes where they're not necessarily growing for flower, but those fields could be very close to operators who are growing for flower. So when growing vast acres of cannabis from seed, this can be a problem. Male and female plants are very similar in physiology, and you can't really see any visual differences until at least four to eight weeks when their sex organs start to mature. 
For male plants, these are pollen sacs. And for females, these are pistils, which are little hair-like appendages that are used to catch the pollen. Now, seeded flower was a huge issue up until the 1970s, when legend has it that Rafael Quintaro, the infamous Guadalajara cartel co-founder, introduced sensamia. Sensamia is a Spanish word that literally translates to without seeds. I wasn't very familiar with the story before the podcast, so I decided to ask Ben from the Humboldt Seed Company what he knew about it. So do you know more about that story? Um, do you want to talk about it? Because I have, I have minimal research done so far on that. So if you want to discuss it, that'd be great. I mean, you know, the only, I think there's a lot of mythology around this story. Um, just cause it's, you know, it's been made, you know, it's been made famous now by Netflix, but, um, I think Netflix is who did that. But, uh, yeah, uh, Rafael, uh, Quintanero, um, Guadalajara, Mexico was, you know, actually, you know, he was a, before he was a, you know, major drug kingpin, he was, you know, a very passionate cannabis farmer and, you know, adopted some techniques that were, you know, fairly common in the, um, you know, in like normal plant breeding space um, and using, you know, uh, silver thiosulfate to, you know, reverse uh, female plants and have them express, you know, male characteristics and male structures that would only contain, you know, female genetics. So kind of, you know, in that way, that was, I guess that was probably um, the last great step in like kind of, human you know humans interactions with cannabis was like was him actually developing that tech that original technique for feminizing seeds and producing yeah what you said the first sensimia that went global like i mean he had fields so big supposedly you could see him from you know from space so <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was awesome That's i think so there's cool. some other folks that claim it but i think he was the one that definitely got the credit and deserved the credit for, for, for sending it so hard. All right. So to produce seedless cannabis, you must first get rid of all of the males. And the easiest way to do that is to grow feminized seeds. So thank you, Rafa, for introducing this practice to cannabis. When cannabis plants don't produce seeds, they increase in yield and overall cannabinoid content. So this was a really big game changer for the industry. And using feminized seeds, it's an excellent way to specifically breed to produce only female plants, right? So how do we feminize our plants? Ben explained it a little bit, but let me break it down for you. So this is achieved through a fascinating technique that manipulates the plant's natural responses. A common method involves using colloidal silver, a solution of pure silver particles suspended in water, or silver thi thiophate, or whatever Ben said. So when applied to a female cannabis plant, um, the silver inhibits the plant's production of ethylene, which is a hormone crucial to flowering and sex determination. This stress encourages the female plant to produce male flowers. Okay, so female plant, female genetics, but stressed out enough to create a male flower and pollen. However, since the plant's genetic makeup remains female, the pollen collected from these flowers will only carry female genes. Breeders then collect this female-only pollen and use it to pollinate other females. The resulting seeds from this cross are almost always guaranteed to be female. I think it's like 98% or something. So there we get feminized. This technique allows growers to focus their efforts on plants that will produce the desired buds without the risk of pollination by male plants. The creation of feminized seeds has revolutionized cannabis cultivation, enabling both commercial and home growers to optimize their harvests and produce consistent high quality cannabis. It's a testament to the incredible adaptability and versatility of the cannabis plant, combining botany, genetics, and innovative gardening techniques. Seeing as how female cannabis plants are so freaking awesome, 
I mean, they produce the flour that we love, get us high. Then you can make seeds from them to grow more plants. I think it's a, a it's time that we show some appreciation for the ladies in our industry. Because all of us gardening and growing this plant are surrounded by women when we're in our garden. And there are so many amazing women in this industry. And with it being Women's Day, why not show some love? So our first guest is Kimmy, owner of Jackalope Farms. And today, She's going to share with us a little bit about what she's been doing in Oklahoma. Cool. Um, yeah, so I'm Kimmy Mullen. I own Jackalope Farms, and I'm in northeast Oklahoma. I have been growing commercial scale for 12 seasons now, 12 or 13. It all kind of blurs. Um, and I started out in Humboldt, California. I was there for years doing the 215 thing. Um, all around there. And then I moved to Maine for a couple of years, did that. And now I'm in Oklahoma and this is my going into my fifth season, but my fourth season on my current farm. Um, and I do like hygge culture. Uh, I make these huge hygge culture beds because the property I happen to buy is 100% clay and rocks. And there was no way that I was going to like bring in a bunch of potting soil to make greenhouses. So I made these massive hugo culture pits and used like a lot of the lumber from my property for like the base and just like using what I have and finding local materials to build the soil. And I'm now going into year four on some of these pits and it is so good. And yeah, I do greenhouse, light depth, organic, regenerative, um, all those things. Amazing. Let's tell people what Hugo culture is. I mean, probably like a lot of people might know, but maybe they don't. I'm in a bubble where I think everyone should know what Hugo culture is, but <laughs> probably yeah. not everyone does. Yeah. So Hugo culture, it's been around for centuries. Um, I think the word is German rooted, but traditionally, like you build these like huge, um, like towers and you like the base is logs and then you add like some compost some nitrogen for the carbon and the um nitrogen to start reacting to decompose and then you just add a little bit of soil on top and you can like it's so flexible you can use so many different things for the in-between layers and then just a little soil on top and traditionally there are these giant things like six feet like tall. Like a teepee kind of thing or like a yeah, mound. Yeah, so you'd have a, yeah, you'd have a southern <laughs> and a northern facing to grow on. So you could do shade on the northern side, sun loving on the south side. Mm -hmm. um, I've adapted it for commercial cannabis growing um, by going in the ground and just kind of, you could also call it like lasagna growing. There's so many terms Yeah, um, pe people throw around. I call them hoogle pits because <laughs> it kind of, it basically is I make a giant pit. I put tons of logs in the bottom as their first layer, then compost any any green material that's around the property, grass, leaves, sticks, throw it all on top and then some soil. <laughs> <laughs> Anything. I'm like, yeah, give me all the material, like all the old Do cannabis stalks. I use rabbit poo. That is like okay. my golden <laughs> secret supply <laughs> it's the only like clean stuff i've really found um in oklahoma like the sourcing of material is really hard out here to find like clean organic stuff um because we're in like glyphosate nation out here. oh yeah 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 um yeah you know I see okay are they your own rabbits or are they from somebody else they are from this guy that's saved in my phone as Bunny Man. Um, he, he's great. He has been raising rabbits for like 30 years. Um, and he's also like an old school weed grower in the Arkansas mountains. He's the coolest guy. Um, and yeah, he basically, he's kind of on his way out. He is pretty sick. But no. he still is running rabbits. Basically, just so I have compost. We're like best friends now. Um, we're super close and yeah the rabbit it's so clean like 
there's no like heavy metal issues because he was doing USDA facilities. So everything had to be super clean um, because they were the rabbits he was raising. He was doing meat rabbits, but he was also doing bio rabbits, which. What the hell um, is a bio rabbit? <laughs> I know it's crazy. This is crazy before I even knew, it, which <laughs> it's semi controversial. And I definitely have mixed feelings on it. But so the rabbits breed and then they take the three week old babies and those are sold to labs and the mm. baby rabbit blood is used for some vaccine that we all got when we were children and they're still it's just like part of the production they need the extremely clean immune cells of the baby rabbit white blood cells wow um, i know which i was like after he told me that i was like oh my god this is like kind of <laughs> messed up <laughs> um but it's also just like the fact of agriculture and like this immune like this vaccine that like everyone got unless you're like not didn't get vaccines um which i'm all pro-choice yeah exactly pro-choice on that we won't go there you know yeah we won't go there but like <laughs> um you know like but it means the rap the rabbits are fed really well like they're very well taken care of okay um, were the rabbits then do they die or do you not know that or like do they drain all their blood <laughs> I don't. I, I haven't gotten. <laughs> I didn't get that far. Um, after he told me, I was like, "Whoa!" But he actually transitioned. <laughs> he stopped doing that in the past couple of years. At, like, I think he only did that for like the first year I was working with him, um, and he just got into basically meat rabbits. All right. Um, so, are you gonna take over his meat rabbit farm after he? Is he going to pass it on to you? <laughs> he would love that, but I'm not going to do that. Oh, man. I do want, like, rabbits and goats, because I do like the, like, using the cold manures um, versus hot. I love that, because, you know, I used to use chicken back in the day, but also where I'm at, it's, like, all chicken farms. Like, chicken houses are everywhere, and they're so disgusting. I have to, like, oh, yeah. drive past them and smell them, and... I'm like, I can't even use chicken manure anymore because, like, all the hormones. And then basically every compost in Oklahoma has starts with chicken litter from mm. these farms that are around here. So even the mushroom compost is based off the chicken litter. And everywhere, it's everywhere. So I just basically can't use anything because I'm so picky. But the rabbits, <laughs> I also have some other rabbit connects. I know this lady who's like really into breeding rabbits for shows <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm really into the rabbit scene. They're great. Uh, 4-H clubs, like. Hell yeah. Great, great um, sources. So you, you brought up a good point. So cold manure versus hot manure. So typically when we're referring to that, it's like um, pelletized poo is cold. Um, and then the reason why like chicken especially is or any poultry is so hot and by hot it's because it has a lot of nitrogen because they poo and pee at the same time. They don't have a separate hole or excrement. It's like the same. What's it called? Starts with a C? <laughs> I don't know. The clitoris. No. <laughs> no. no. Don't confuse, don't confuse don't, these people. I know. Don't, don't listen to that. <laughs> Do not listen to that. <laughs> oh my god <laughs> um cloaca so, yeah there you go the cloaca and they have their egg out of it so they it's one hole that does it all one ring that's your rule them all <laughs> <laughs> um so you like the cold poo better than the hot poo and that is because of why um Easier to work with, less concern, um, especially on the commercial sense. So, you know, E. coli, salmonella, all that stuff. If people don't compost their manu their hot manures well and for enough time, that is totally a concern. Like, so when you hear about lettuce outbreaks that have E. coli, generally it's from like that. Like the mm -hmm. the manure is wasn't done right. So that's like a huge concern for me and. It's honestly, yeah, I'm grossed out by chicken manure because all the chicken houses I live around. So I don't even mess with that. I have used horse. Um, there's a lot of horse farms around here. And then there's a lot of dairy, like cattle, 
but they're generally like free range. So there's not really barns to collect cow manure. So first of all, I have got to say what a valiant effort to remain true to her core principles of sustainability and organic practices. This is the kind of legacy grower you want to support. Not only is she growing organically, but she's building up her native soil with waste inputs from her community. There's a huge difference between organic and sustainable. And I want to point that out. Sustainability has three pillars. One is what's good for the earth or the ecosystem your actions are impacting. The other is the community who shares that ecosystem. And lastly is the person who's making these actions, so the gardener themselves. That being said, while growing outdoor in the ground is by far the most sustainable way to grow, you are the most important piece to this puzzle. So do what's best for your situation. But keep in mind those other two pillars and being mindful about how you can impact those around you better. That's really what sustainability is all about right? Doing something that can be sustained over a long period of time without running out of resources and having a positive impact on the organisms around. Contributing, being a contribution to the ecosystem. So I totally understand if you can't grow outside due to your climate or local regulations or even your safety. So many people have told me that they think their plants will be stolen if they grew them outside. And that is such a shame because like we mentioned in the previous episode with Dr. Riley Kirk, outdoor cannabis just hits different. This is a perfect time to introduce our next guest who is Dr. Riley Kirk. Um, She's been doing so much for the cannabis industry from consumer education to shaping local policy in New Hampshire, teaching at the university. I mean, she's got nonprofit. She has so much going on. So I'm just really thrilled to share, to have this platform, this space to share a little bit of what she's doing so I can connect more people in this community, this myceliated web of consciousness of folks who are just passionate and driven by this plant. So So, uh, my name is Riley Kirk. I am a cannabis scientist, but also a cannabis science communicator on TikTok, Instagram, uh, YouTube sometimes. Hopefully I'll get better at YouTube this year. That's one of my resolutions. Um, but yeah, so I have my PhD in pharmaceutical sciences. So I really specialize in studying and understanding what molecules nature makes and how we can use them as medicine. So I've studied hundreds of different medicinal plants, but really my focus now is on cannabis because when I started well, let me back this up. I've been using cannabis since I was 14 years old. Like I love cannabis. It's my favorite medicinal plant. It's really what made me trust and believe in nature as the main like healing mechanism that I need. Like nature makes 60% of the it actually is the source of 60% of the pharmaceutical drugs that we currently have. They started in nature and then we just changed them a little bit to be able to patent them and often make them, you know, more powerful, but they start as natural compounds. So that's really what my background's in. When I started to talk about cannabis and really talk about it, you know, online and publicly, I realized there's this massive gap in consumer education, but people want the information. We just haven't really had any avenues to get it out there because of the legal status of cannabis, right? It's a schedule one drug. So even talking about it online is extremely difficult. Um, You know, finding reputable sources that you can trust and you can make sure that it's someone you can talk to, that's really difficult. So, I started making content in, I think it was 2020. Yeah, it was the pandemic. And I was like, I'm bored. (laughs) Open TikTok. (laughs) Um, I was like, I'm going to make content. Like, why not? So I started making content and it just resonated super well. And I always wanted to communicate Like, I want to tell the science because I like to use science as advocacy. It's not just me saying my opinion. It's my opinion based in science. And I'm using it to be pro-cannabis, essentially saying how safe it is, how effective it is for different conditions, and also, like, how to use cannabis and from a harm reduction standpoint, right? Like, how can we make sure that people have a positive experience with cannabis the first time they're using it? How can we make sure that people who want to curate their experience for a specific medical condition or whatever it is, even if it's just for 
adult use purposes. Like there's ways to curate your experience either way. Um, so I just started making content like that. And, you know, people really, really appreciated this information being free and accessible and just out on the internet, not behind a paywall in academia or not, you know, these, the you know, super, super secret places behind, you know, sign up for my course. Um, so it, did super well and I still do it to this day, I guess four years later now. And I currently am also a, am a co-founder of a nonprofit with cannabis research. I continue to work in cannabis research also um, through teaching through the University of Rhode Island and doing research through there and just working within the industry too. It's been absolutely magical uh, where the like scientific perspective of cannabis has taken me. I never thought that this would be my life, but it's been really cool. <laughs> Dude, that's amazing. I, I feel the same way. I'm like, how lucky am I that this is my career? Like, I love cannabis. And this whole podcast is an ode to the plant for the plant. It's not about the people I'm interviewing. Interviewing. It's not about me. It's about how magical and amazing this plant is. And I just love that you bring the science to prove that because I can go around being, um, you know, dirty hippie saying like, it heals everything, you know, grow this plant outside. We can make paper from it or from it, building materials, we can um, slow down like epilepsy, seizures, and uh, pain reduction, inflammation. But having the science back backing it, and not just being like, "Oh, she's some chick from NorCal growing a bunch of weed." Um, of course, she hey, we need we need we need all the advocates though. For real, like you know, we all love the plant, and we work together. You know, I take the scientific perspective. You take the outgrown outdoor grown perspective. Like if we can all just really vocalize what makes the relationship to this plant so special to us and show that that's coming from so many different perspectives and angles and experiences. Like that's how we make change and we're doing it as a community. It's really, really cool to see everyone coming together and like making real change. All right, I think that it is so important to remember the power of community and coming together to support one another. So, Thank you, Dr. Riley, for everything that you've done for this community. Our next guest is someone who I believe has been an integral part of the cannabis community. She's been supporting legacy growers, building brands, participating in global cannabis events, and really speaking up for the plant and the people who use it. I'm so excited to have you here today, Luna. Um, it's been a while since we've actually talked, so I think... Um, you know, when we were talking before the show started, uh, we had met at CBCB. I was hosting a dab bar. I was selling my company, my brand, medical uh, brand during Prop 215 days at Cannabis Buyers Club holiday party. And I remember um, I had been giving out shatter with like double terminated quartz crystals and like flower of life stamped onto it. And I gave you one. And I remember you saying like, these are... This is what I'm going to miss about Prop 215. And I was just like, you know, that feeling like you're right. This is everything's going to change. The whole industry as we knew it then, um, 2015, 16 to 2018 to today has changed so much. And you've really been at the forefront. I mean, all over uh, the global cannabis market and industry and seeing these changes firsthand. So I'm really excited. Um, so without further ado, please introduce yourself and tell everyone what you've been doing. What a wonderful reminder. And it's so funny when you said back in the 215 days, I wanted to like just blurt out like RIP 215. So it's kind of interesting that that was kind of your point is the the death, you know, of, of everything. So I, I consider myself a culture keeper. That's kind of, you know, yeah, I build brands. Yeah, I'm in business, but that's not my background. I have a master's in education. Um, I taught in public schools, um, jails and juvenile halls for a decade before coming into cannabis. But really, I've always been a cannabis. I grew up in the East Bay during 215. So when I was 11 years old in middle school, it legalized. So I've been smoking it, being around, been around growing it. Um, and not just consuming it, but also transacting it and using it to help me get through college and help me buy my home and all these things that are so important um, to building wealth, especially as a woman. Um, it's been such an uplifting force that my whole career has been centered around giving back, not only to the people, but the plant itself. Um, so a lot of folks know me um, and for my activist work. I was on the early um, equity 
uh, work working group for Oakland, which built the first equity program that the entire country copied for better or worse. Obviously, what ended up getting instituted was not what we had asked for, or what we had written, but um, really, that's been really trying to right the wrongs of the war on drugs um, has been really central, right? So it's like I'm trying to use my privilege, my educational privilege, my class privilege, my white privilege to really bring awareness to, although it is really fun to be in an emerging industry, I'm in tech, we go to a lot of trade shows, there's a lot of social events. Um, Really, at the end of the day, my heart is with um, the veterans who don't have access, folks that are still sitting in prison for this, um, people that are losing their um, kids to CPS, their dogs getting shot at raids, like there's still a war going on. And I think it's really important. Part of kind of my mission is to um, keep social justice at the core, you know, social, you know, corporate social responsibility, diversity, equity and inclusion. These are all kind of buzzwords that get thrown around. And my job is to make sure that there's actual impact, which is why I chose the the, the title uh, chief impact officer at iSpire, because really what I'm trying to do is actually bigger than just, you know, create revenue and, and build the industry. It's really remembering that we're a movement at, at the core. Yeah, definitely. Um, Can you talk about specific projects? Like I know you mentioned the Last Prisoner Project and just things that you are doing that you've seen positive impact and change from what you've been doing. Well, when we used to do our DAB devices, um, each of them went to benefit either, you know, the the yellow one was honey themed. It went to bee pollination or bee bee conservation. Um, We did we've we give back to um, the Social Impact Center, which does uh, expungements for folks with cannabis crimes. Um, we're working with uh, the Cheech and Chong team and uh, the Grow Media team for South by Southwest to sponsor their Last Prisoner Project benefit event that's happening there in Austin, Texas next month. Um, and we do a lot of work in our local community with uh, local artists. We do a First Friday event where we open up our offices um, and include the, the, the general community to really show that we want to give back to art because we are based in Venice Beach, um, which is a very art-centric uh, community and space. And it's also the epicenter right now of cannabis. The Bay Area used to be, but now it's L.A. Um, wow. And so, yeah, so we're a very social um, crew. And so people see look to us as being, you know, we're the, the beach cleanup sponsors for uh, the Connected Cannabis Group. Um, And we are involved in, we just did a a Chinese Lunar New Year event where we sponsored that for the Asian American community. So really when anyone needs anything, whether it's like advanced nutrients, Big Mike does the backpack stuffing, the, um, the heroes, I'm forgetting what they're called. Um, they're called something heroes and we do backpack stuffing for our house, our, you know, housing insecure neighbors in LA, which is a huge problem in LA is homelessness. Um, so really there's nothing we don't really consider is important to us. Anything that's important to our community is important to us. And that's really been my role. And it's really exciting to actually put into action a lot of the things that we want to see in the world. And I've been having such a great time being able to actually have a company that puts their money where their mouth is and where their heart is and, and shows up. Um, you know, even Sonoma County, you know, there's very few people that were showing up to, to their, you know, they're trying to fight for their zoning and, and their right to grow and for small farmers. Um, And, you know, there's a very small circle of brands that are showing up and that are donating and that are, you know, supporting them. And they've, you know, reached out to me and said, thank you. There aren't many, you know, we're a global brand, right? We're an empty vaporizer hardware company. We're, we're a public company on the NASDAQ. So we're not a plant touching, which is, you know, a benefit and a curse. Obviously we don't have a lot of the dramas that the, that the plant touching has, but um, an upside, another one is really having access to a budget that we can support these, you know, small, but really mighty movements that are going to set precedent to help change the the framework and the landscape in California to make sure that we're not boxing out uh, legacy and, you know, home growers and small growers and all of these, you know, small organizations that aren't, um, that don't have the, the, the large funding behind them to, to really survive and thrive in this industry. Wow. It's really sad to see our legacy growers being pushed out of the market because of outdated laws that essentially limit funding to these operators. It's currently very difficult to bank or get funding if your business touches cannabis plants. In fact, I've had my own bank account shut down when I had a commercial cannabis business. Despite it being licensed and legal in my state, it's still federally illegal. Despite an overwhelming number of states supporting cannabis businesses, the federal government has made little movement to make any changes regarding cannabis, which is currently a Schedule One substance and being treated the same as heroin. 
This is completely unacceptable. And as a community, we should be pushing for descheduling, not rescheduling. I don't want to hear this bullshit. Move it from schedule one to schedule three. No, F that. We need descheduling. This is a plant. It should be in the same boat as freaking growing tomatoes. I don't care. It's a (sighs) Department of Agriculture issue, not a freaking drug enforcement. Okay, but anyway, um, obviously you can tell that this gets me heated. We really need to speak up for this as a community and get together and do our part. I know that politics are awful or can be awful and boring and argumentative, but uh, participating where we can so that our voices are heard is really important. And our next guest is someone who is doing that. And I really love her perspective because it is, it's unique like each one one of our perspectives is. She's just an all-around amazing woman, and I'm so blessed that I actually live by her now, so I'm going to have to reach out and hang out in person. Which brings me to our last guest for today's episode, Bess Byers, also known as Canna Bess. She is not only a cannabis advocate, but amazing cannabis photographer. So if you need some, if you're a brand looking for some photography, Holler at your girl. She's an influencer on Instagram with almost 100,000 followers, a political journalist writing for Reason Magazine, and she's doing what she can to influence pot positive Yeah, politics. so my name is Bess, and I have been in the legal cannabis industry for nine years. And when I first got into the industry, I was working, uh, one of my girlfriends from college, she owned a grow in Arlington. Um, her farm was Western Cultured. And I had just started doing um, like the cannabis photography. Their brand is very outdoor focused. Their tagline is light up the moment. And I've always been a photographer. I mean, I was carrying film to school in like third grade. Um, and so when she brought me on, you know, kind of of the branding and like the photography I did. She was like, I really, you know, want to bring the Northwest to life with this photography. And cannabis lifestyle photography was something that nobody was really doing. It was such a new, like a new industry. And, um, you know, I got into the industry in 2015 and I went on a Tinder date. And the only reason I swiped wide on this guy is because he um, owned a couple shops in LA. And I was like, well, if anything, this could be a good networking opportunity. <laughs> networking. And so, um, you know, I was on our date. We were at his, we met up at his office in Santa Monica and he was like rolling up some strawberry cough. And there were like all these weed magazine covers on his wall. And I told him how I wanted to differentiate my weed photography from everything else I did. And he goes, do people call you cannabis? And I said, no, but they're about to. And it really just (laughs) opened this huge floodgates of, you know, something I had never expected. I never set out to, you know, be a cannabis photographer or be a quote unquote influencer. Um, You know, I just got into the industry because I like to smoke. I like to incorporate smoking weed into everything I do, hiking, snowboarding, travel, chilling with friends. Um, And so it all just kind of was so unexpected. And through that, um, I gained an audience, um, you know, on Instagram predominantly. Um, and then through there, I started my own creative agency because I really wanted to have control over the brands I worked with. I wanted to make sure I was working with companies that shared my passion for the plant, you know, growing it sustainably, responsibly, giving back, you know, they're a good employer. Um, you know, are they a good representation of what I want to see legalization, um, going forward? So now, now, nine years later, um, I still have my agency. I still work with brands doing cannabis creative content. And then during the pandemic, I also got a job in politics. So now um, I'm doing political activism as well. Um, I've always been very political. Um, and so now I'm just kind of doing the best of both worlds. I feel like I really just am so excited with, you know, just everything going on. I just I'm so blessed to be here and to be in this industry and the opportunities it's provided for me. Definitely. I read your bio on your website. Beautiful website, by the way, and beautiful pictures. You're gorgeous. You. I love everything <laughs> you. that you're doing. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> yeah, of course. So crazy, though, like your background living in China um, and then being focused on politics, but then switching to cannabis. And it was all influenced because of your friend's I-502? 
Yeah, so, I mean, I was living in L.A. at the time. I lived in Beijing, China after college, and that's what made me even more political is, you know, living in a communist country. They they say they're proud socialist, but they're very communist. Um, and it just woke me up to things like state government spying on your digital correspondence, state-run media, um, just censorship. And so I came back. I was living in L.A. I had, um, you know, gotten into politics down there. I'm really passionate about the national debt, educating people about the national debt. And my friend that owned the, the own Western culture had reached out to me and she was like, hey, um, you know, we're hiring. Would you be interested? And at that time, I was kind of at this crossroads of, you know, I'd been in L.A. for four years. I had an opportunity in D.C. in politics. I was going to go out there. Everybody said, go to D.C. You've already started doing political content. And the only person that said to get into weed was my dad. And it's funny <laughs> because he said pot is recession proof. And, and it's true, you know, even in a downturn in the economy, people will always find money, you know, for their vice, whether it's cigarettes, alcohol, going to get your hair done, um, cannabis. And so it was crazy to me, especially when the pandemic hit, you know, to see just like, it wasn't just recession proof, it was pandemic proof. Um, and so that's, I mean, it was a month, you know, within a month of just getting the offer. I was back in Washington working in a grow. So when I moved back, I was like, oh my gosh, this is not at all what I expected. I was working in a grow, working like 12 hour days. You know, I was like, I thought I was going to be doing sales and marketing. And instead I'm like cloning 500 plants and like getting my hair caught <laughs> in the frog net. Um, but, you know, everything happens for a reason. Because even that experience really translated over into how I photograph grows. You know, being in a grow allowed me to see like, what are things I should be looking for if I'm doing macro photos? Like, you know... Is there any sort of like weird issues with the leaves or spider mites? You know, not that I've been a lot of gross with spider mites, but you know, it's <laughs> you're good to grow. Um, and so it just everything happens for a reason. And I look back on it now, and it's like it was such a fun, humbling time in my life. Wow, I couldn't have said it better myself. Cannabis working in the cannabis industry has been the most fulfilling fun and humbling experience of my life as well. And I'm just honored to be here today sharing these stories from women like you and Kimmy and Dr. Riley across the industry, each making waves in their respective fields. So if you're a woman listening to this episode and you're interested in getting into the space, please reach out to me and I will try to help you as much as I can, pulling from not only my experience, but this amazing community I'm privileged to be connected with. And for my men out there, I see you too, King, and I appreciate everything you've contributed to this space as well. But really, none of you would be here today if it wasn't for a woman. And that's your mom. So give your mom a hug and share some of your pot with her because families that smoke together are much happier. All right, so you've heard from a few ladies in the space who are all on different paths, but ultimately driven by the same force. And that's this plant that we are here celebrating together. So if you want to learn more about what each of these guests is doing in their own space, please visit the website at queenofthesungrown.com forward slash podcast. And I have all of the guests with their links and bios and places where you can connect further with them. And again, the full interviews are available on Patreon. So check that out at patreon.com slash queenofthesungrown. But now... It's time to check on the grow along. Remember, the purpose of this grow along is to contribute data to Blaze, Botanical Latitude and Zone Evaluation, which is our initiative to help form outdoor growing zones for cannabis specifically. If you want to participate or donate to the cause, check it out at patreon.com slash queen of the sun grown. And I do want to say that this year, our sample size is incredibly small. There are so many of you reaching out to me wanting to participate. And I apologize if, if everyone didn't get the opportunity to get in on this year. But we really wanted to just make sure that we had our processes in place. We want to ensure that the survey questions are adequate and getting collecting the, the proper data and simply just like organizing this huge endeavor. It's a lot of work 
and it's really just me and my co-producer, Cat Lady. So any donations tremendously help us get this work done. And we appreciate everyone who has you know, reached out, told us that it's a great idea, that they're rooting for us and want to participate. It really means the world to us. So at this point in time, seeds are being shipped to participants and germination will begin soon. In fact, next week's episode is all about seed germination and providing your seedlings with an optimal environment suited just for them. So tune in next week for tips and tricks to optimize your seedlings life. And remember, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. This episode was written by me and produced by Cat Lady, along with Abteen Yeager, music by Ayla Nerio, and brought to you by Queen of the Sun Grown, a woman owned business that teaches cultivators, large and small, how to be more sustainable by connecting the flora, fauna, and fungi within your ecosystem. So please check it out, queenofthesungrown.com, and tune in next week to learn more about this amazing plant. Thank you. Hi.